Kaylee, from the moment I've met you, I've known that you're the one. <laughs> Kaylee, will you marry me? Give me a second. Magic 8 Ball, should I marry him? I know we keep talking about it, I keep thinking about it, and I just can't get it off my mind. I don't have any clarity on it. And what do you want to do? Do you want to have more kids? I mean, I'd love to have more kids, but you know, I just I don't know if I can really answer that. I, I don't know. Well, you know what to do. Where is it? Oh, well, Magic 8 Ball's right there. Just pass it to me. Well, we did what they told us to do. We tried it five times. What do you think? I'd love to go back, but you know. You know, you know what we gotta do. You know what we gotta ask. I'm gonna do it. No, you got it. It is certain. Well, good morning, 9 a.m. Y'all alive today? You're grateful to be in church, man. So honored to be with you today, to be your pastor. It's such a joy. If you are Hey, if you're a first-time guest experience kind of walking into this, especially if church is new to you, um, I want to welcome you. Thanks for taking a risk on a church. I get it. Like, it can be awkward going to a church for the first time, even though you've seen it online. You might have watched a video, but you're kind of wondering, is it going to be weird? Like, when are they going to make me stand up? We don't do any of that. I promise you, we're just seriously glad that you're a part of this. And today, look, we're starting a brand new series. You picked a great weekend to be here called Magic 8-Ball. Now, I know what you're thinking. What in the world has this church succumbed to now that they're bringing sorcery and witchcraft into the church? What's next, the Ouija board in a seance? All right, everybody chill out, all right? Take a deep breath. I know it's Halloween month, but that's not the point here. Um, all right, listen, I get it. The magic eight ball was invented in the early 40s, 1940s, as a fortune-telling device. I get it. Did you know that it was recreated in like the 60s as a child's toy, okay? So nobody believes that this has power. Nobody believes that this has authority, right? Oh my God, if you could only see your face right now. <laughs> but rather like this is just a, a sort of a kickoff way of a, a sort of describing how a lot of us at times feel like we're making decisions. We're just sort of like shaking the eight ball. We're indecisive. We, we lack confidence in a lot of areas in our ability to make choices. And, and I'll prove it to you because some of you might go, well, I'm really good at decision making. And you might be. But yet there is an area of all of our lives that well, I don't know what it is about this one question, but it seems to stump us. And it literally happens every day. It's called, what's for dinner? Okay, so you're with me, right? Like, what is it about this? Like, you know dinner happens every single day, right? But yet it seems like when the shadow of dinner comes across our nightfall, we just don't know what to do. Like, you run a Fortune 500 company and you make decisions all day long. Some of you oversee a sales team and make decisions. You oversee a classroom with 35 you know, first graders, you, you, some of you manage a household where you're managing schedules and making decisions, but yet when it comes to dinner, we got nothing. And so we give the same reply, which is, I don't, yeah, I don't know, I don't care. Which, by the way, if you are a newly married man or you're about to be married, let your boy let you in on something, all right? I've been at it now for 13 years. When your wife looks at you or your girlfriend and says, I don't care, what she really means is I care, I just really want to know how well you know me. I want you to look into the depths of my soul and the woman's psyche. You should know my mood, my feeling, my taste at this point. This is a test. See, it's true. Because the moment you pull into the drive-thru of Taco Bell, all of a sudden, all of a sudden she starts caring, right? Uh-huh. So I just figured, like, if this pastor thing doesn't work out, I'm going to um, open up a franchise of restaurants called um, I Don't Care. <laughs> so that way when they say, where do you want to eat? I don't care. You're like, let's go. Let's get in the car, right? It's, it's going to be American and Mexican. You can get burgers, chicken wings, and you can get tacos. Come on, somebody, right? <laughs> I'm telling you. Also called the cookout, because you can get a burger and a side of quesadilla. It's amazing. You <laughs> might be on something here. But isn't it interesting, though, like when you think about how you process and make decisions, how like in one area of your life you can be bold and confident, but then on the other side of your life you can be unsure and insecure. And then we put on top of that, like most of us, we are really good at giving other people advice. 
I'm really good at telling you what I think you should do based on the evidence that you're giving to me. And so I'm really good at giving you advice, but for whatever reason, I'm not very good at applying the own advice that I'm giving to you to my life. Oh, I'm preaching already at 928. You know this is true. What is it about our inability at sometimes to be confident in the decisions that we make? This is why my excitement level is on a whole new level today for this teaching series. Because the number one question that I get as a pastor, and I've been at this now for 14 years, is some form of, Nate, how do I know if this is God's will for my life? Now, if you're not a believer, you would just frame it differently. How do I know if this is the right choice? Is this, a, is this a God thing, or is it just bad Chinese food from the night before? Like, is this good? Is it God? And, and so we often don't know when we leave it to the eight ball, you know? Like, should I marry this person? Um, should I start the business? Will South Carolina beat Clemson now that they got a good win under their... <laughs> Definitely not. That says... Actually, it says, as I see it, yes. That's what it literally says. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just preaching the truth here, right? So, but that's, but that's how we don't, what, what, how do I know if this is God's will for my life? That's why I really want to um, encourage you, challenge you. Would you make it a part? Would you, would you do yourself a favor and to say, you know what, for these next four weekends, as we uh, really start this conversation, it's more than one talk. It's going to be a series of four or five that you're a part of every weekend here at LifePoint. If you miss a weekend, watch it online throughout the week. If you're a part of a life group, actually show up to your life group for the next. That was probably a life group leader. I hear you, right? And I get it. Like Life's been busy. We've been, we're like six weeks in now. Maybe you've been to one. Maybe you've been to none. But just say, you know what? For these next four week, weeks, like I'm going to go. And then don't ever go again if you don't want to. But like give yourselves these four weeks as we begin to unpack and discover what God's will is. Because that's my goal. I want to help you find and follow the will of God for your life. Because here's the big idea. And if you take notes, I want you to write this down. You cannot follow what you first have not found. You can't follow something that you first haven't found. And I want to give a lot of freedom. I think that this series is really going to free you in a lot of areas of your decision making as we first begin to understand how do I find God's will so that I can now follow it in my life. And I think that this is where we have to start. We got to start with this baseline belief that God has a purpose, a plan, and a will for my life. That God, you have a purpose, you actually have a plan, and you have a will for my life. If you don't believe that, then let me take you to what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul writes this to the Roman Christians. He says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I love when Paul writes this because he's writing to a group of um, brand new Roman believers. And what he's saying is that um, as now as a Jesus follower, you don't belong to the kingdom or the system of the world anymore. You now belong to the kingdom of God. And so don't let the world conform you, shape you, mold you anymore. When I was thinking about this, um, I thought about Plato. Y'all, my props this series are going to be on another level, right? I thought about, like, how many props do you really need? Um, just preach the Bible. Okay. Um, but I thought about Plato, and isn't Plato interesting? It's like one of these weird things, like every kid loves it, and every parent hates it. Okay? You with me? Right? Because kids love it, but parents hate it because, it, what, it gets crusty. They leave it out. It gets everywhere. It's in your carpet. It's in their hair. It's in their clothes. It's on your, your brand new couch. And so this, this is actually a true story. A couple years ago when uh, our daughter Rosalie was a little bit younger, she was making out her, <laughs> she was making out her Christmas list, and she, put, she wanted this, like, uh, Play-Doh kitchen set. And my wife was like, baby, um, you can't put that on your list because Santa doesn't make Play-Doh anymore. She said, Mommy, why is she make Play-Doh? And, and then was, I don't know why. She's like, because there's a shortage. There's a Play-Doh shortage, right? And some of you ladies are like, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. God, God understands that lie, right? So, um, but I got this image when I was thinking about what Paul's saying. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That literally for some of you, um, you didn't come to Christ till later in life. And so for 13 years, 18 years, 27 years, the world was molding you into the ways and the pattern of the world. That's not bad. That's just that's just how life is. And so the ways and the pattern of the world often sounds like this. Just do what makes you feel happy. If it's good, it must be good. 
The world says there's no such thing as absolute truth. What's true for you is true for who am I to challenge what you believe is to be true. It's all about feelings. It's all about emotion. Not, not everything, but this is the conforming to the pattern of the world. And then Paul says, okay, now wait a minute. You're a Jesus follower now. You don't belong to the system of the world. Now you've got to allow the Lord through the Holy Spirit in you to conform you into this new image, this new identity. Do you see this? This is why you can be a believer and love Jesus, but your life is still a mess. This is why you can be saved, but yet you're still making some of these wrong decisions because you're still allowing the pattern and the culture of the world to mold you. And Jesus says, that's not who you are anymore. This is why, man, this is why the word of God is so important to be in God's word. It helps transform your mind. This is why uh, community and life group and prayer, it, what's happening, you're, you're renewing your mind. Why? Because what you think produces what you believe, and what I believe reflects how I behave. So I'll have wrong living if I don't have right thinking. Are you with me? It all starts with the thought and the mind. I gotta, I gotta have new thought life. I, I'm not a loser. I'm not a deadbeat. I'm not condemned. I, I, I'm, I do have what it takes. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. It all begins with what you think impacts what you believe and ultimately determines how you behave. Are you with me? All right, and so Paul says this is, this is what you need, you need to begin to allow the Lord to do. And then he says, then. Everyone shout then. then. Not before, but then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let me say, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. God's will is good, it is pleasing, and it is perfect. That does not mean that life won't be hard because often good things come with difficulty. It does not mean that you won't have to sacrifice certain aspects of your life. Because often perfection has to go through a refinery process. So what God wants to do in your life, not because he's a mean God, but because he's a loving Heavenly Father, is he wants to get some of these old patterns, habits, lifestyles out of your life. Why? Because there's something better for you. That God's will is good, it is perfect, and it is pleasing. And the truth is today, all of us, especially if you're a Jesus follower, um, all of us tried to filter, is this God or not, um, different ways. Like I'll show you um, three today. The, the, the first one, and these, by the way, are all, we've all done it, all really bad theology, okay? The first one is, is what I call um, if then, then that. You done this? All right, God, if you do this, then I'll do that. <laughs> also called the bargaining method, right? Like, Lord, if you do this for me, oh, I promise I'll do that for you. And this started at a really young age, right? When, you, when we were kids, we would do this when we were kids. For me, I would be outside, you know, shooting basketball, and I'd be like, all right, Lord, if I make this shot, that girl's going to go out with me, right? <laughs> Brick. And I'd be like, best two out of three, because you're the God of the second chance. Come on. Like, <laughs> I was preaching when I was 10, right? So, but, but see, it's funny when you're a kid, but it's serious when you're an adult. And how many times have we bargained with God and we said, God, if you will just save my baby girl, I will serve you the rest of my life. God, if you will get me that job, I promise I will honor you with my finances. God, if you would just remove that sickness, that cancer, that disease out of my loved one's body, I promise, Lord, I will use it to be a testimony. If you do this, then I will do that. Only for God not to agree with your bargaining plea. And this is why many of you, you have sick faith. You have faith, but it's sick. It's, it, you've lost your confidence in God because why? You've been approaching him like this and God didn't well answer the way you wanted him to. It's not healthy. It's not biblical. The second one method that we kind of filter God is what I call the flipping point method. Now, don't self-identify yourself by laughing here, but how many times have you been like, Lord, I need a word. God, I need a word from you today. And you grab your Bible that you don't really ever read or study, but you're like, I'm just going to flip and I'm going to point and that's my verse. Right? So you're like, okay, Jesus, this is me right here. Judas hung himself. Okay, that's not it. That, <laughs> let's, let's get it again, right? This is me right here. Boom. Right? And you're like, 1 Chronicles 19.4. So Hananiah seized David's envoys, shaved them, and cut off their garments at the buttocks and sent them away. Like, wait a minute. You want me to do what? You want me to shave a man's beard and cut off his clothes at the butt? Like, what is, this is not, okay. So you see this? You've done this. 
This is not good. This is bad, all right? This is not how God reveals his will to you. And then the third one, and this is probably the most dangerous. Um, this is what, what, what's called the popular opinion method. This is where we begin to survey and ask everybody their opinion on what you think I should do. You're, you're doing Facebook polls, Instagram surveys. Um, you're asking everybody that you know about what they feel is best for your life. Now, I'm gonna talk about this in weeks to come. It is important to have people speak into the influence of your life, but you've gotta be very careful at who you allow to have a seat at the table of the decision-making of your life. You gotta be very careful. That's a selected group only, but yet we just go with the popular opinion, and what most people will tell you, and, and these are good-hearted people, is they'll just basically tell you what you wanna hear, not often what you need to hear. So we begin to filter God's will through these things that are unhealthy and are not true. And so here's what I wanna to do today. If you haven't noticed, I'm just gonna lay a solid foundation. And then over the next three weekends, I'm gonna really walk through each of these. So here's kind of the structure of the message today. I wanna to give you, um, I'm gonna share with you two aspects of what God's will is not. And then I'm gonna give you three layers of what the will of God is. So again, if you're taking notes today, let's, uh, let's write this first one down. The first thing is this. The will of God is not a plan that you find. It is a path that you follow. Man, I want you to get this. The will of God is not a plan that you find, but rather it is like a path that you follow. This bad ideology that we developed somewhere that says that God has a one specific plan for my life. And if I got to spend all my energy finding that one plan, and then when I find the plan, I've got to make every decision to stay on the plan. And then when life isn't going well, it must be because I didn't find the right plan, or maybe I didn't find the plan in the first place. And so I don't know, like, I, I, if I pick the wrong college, and then I'm going to meet the wrong people, if I meet the wrong people and marry the wrong spouse, if I marry the wrong spouse, my life is going to be miserable, and I'm going to birth the wrong kids, and if I birth the wrong kids, then I'm going to feel unfulfilled, and I'm going to have the wrong job and the wrong career, and I'm always going to wonder, what if? <sighs> Y'all feel this? You feel this, right? Am I, is this true? And it's because somewhere along the line, not from God's word, you develop this ideology or we're told that God has a one specific plan for your life as if God is limited to one thing. Can I free you? The will of God is not a specific plan, but rather it is a path that you follow. And the path is a person and his name is Jesus. How do I know this? Look what um, Jesus said in John 10, verse 14 and 15. This is gonna be one of our main texts that I'm gonna really unpack next Sunday when you come back. But Jesus is speaking to the disciples and to the religious leader onlookers. So he's speaking to his, his disciples, but he can, he can tell that the Pharisees are in the background. And he says uh, this. He says, I am the good shepherd. But all through scripture, we see God refer to himself as a good shepherd. He says, I know my sheep. I hate to, I hate to tell you this, but that's us. Like we're sheep. We're not always intelligent. We're not the wisest. Probably smell at times. Like that's just, that's the relationship here. All right, we're good. He says, and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for my sheep. Now, what's amazing about shepherding, if you ever study shepherding, which why would you, because you're normal, but um, <laughs> if you ever study shepherding, it's, it is really impressive how you could have multiple herds of sheep in a sheep pen with different shepherds' sheep in that pen. But when a shepherd goes over to the sheep gate and calls his sheep to come, only that shepherd's sheep will move. Why? Because they know his voice. That's, that's the one that's going to lead me to protection. That's the one that's going to provide for me. That's the one that's going to lead me beside still waters. That, am I preaching psalms? That's the one that's going to lead me uh, into wide pastures. That's the one that's going to help me when harm's way comes in. It is amazing how sheep have the ability to know the voice of their shepherd. I think when I tell you that we're going to talk about how to find and follow the will of God, what I really want to help you do is determine what God's voice sounds like. Because if we're not going to be able to follow what we can't find, we got to know what God's voice sounds like. If you know God's voice, you'll know his ways. If you know his ways, then you can begin to step in to his will. Yeah, God's will, let me free you. It's not a specific plan, but rather it's a path and it's a person and his name is Jesus. The second thing I would tell you about the will of God, what it's not, is God's will is not hidden. Like, contrary to what you might think, it, it, God isn't trying to, like, beanboozle you and confuse you and hide something from you. How, how do I know this? There's a lot of scriptures, but Jeremiah 29, 13, God says this to the prophet. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You're going you're to find me 
if you just come looking for me. When I, when I thought about this idea of um, seek me and find me, I thought of um, how much my kids love playing hide and go seek. Your, your kids like this? I don't know what it is. Like, it's like a universal language for kids. Like, my kids still love it. And you know when the, your kids get older, you, you hide differently. Like now, now they're nine and six, my older two. And so like now I'm like, it's all about them not finding me. Like I'll go in the backyard, dig a hole and breathe through a straw just so they can't. You know? <laughs> Some of you are crazy like that, you know what I'm saying? But you remember when they were really little? What was, the goal? what was my goal as dad? It was for them to find me. So like they would count and they'd be over in the corner, you know, counting and I'd like find a chair and I'd like hide with like half my body sticking out, right, like this. And, you know, they'd be like, all right, ready or not, here we come. And you hear the little, you know, pitter patter of their feet. And, and, and sometimes they would still walk by me and then you'd whistle, you know, you're making animal noises. Why? Because the goal as a dad, as a mom, when your kids are little is you want them to find you. Can I tell you something about God? God is really bad at hide and go seek. And he doesn't care. He, he's a good father. How many of you know that God wants you to discover him? He wants to be in a relationship with you. He's not trying to hide, limit, or, or, or pretend. God wants you to know his heart. And Jeremiah says, man, if you just seek God with all that you are, you're going to find his will for your life. It's not, it's not a, a plan that you could miss out on and the rest of the trajectory of your life is over. And it's not hidden that God's will wants to be known. So just a couple things of what God's will is not. Let me now kind of walk you through what I believe are three ways that God reveals his will to us. And when I was thinking about this, I started thinking about how important decision making really is. I want you to think about this. Like your life, my life, is the culmination of the decisions that we make. Your life is not the culmination of good intentions. When it comes down to it, your life is not the culmination of great ideas or things that you know you should do. But at the end of the day, you are living in the result of the decisions that you make. And you better believe that the enemy, the adversary, the devil knows that. And so what he wants you to do, because decision making is everything, is he wants you to just leave it to chance. He wants you to roll the dice. But I believe that God wants you to walk through a door. And so there are three ways that God reveals his will to us, and I would say that these are in order of importance. So the very first way that God reveals his will to us through scripture is what's called the sovereign will of God. The sovereign will of God. And imagine that like a door, this has the ability to open. So God's sovereign will, if you're unfamiliar with that word, it just simply means supreme in power and all-knowing. So if something or someone is sovereign, it means that it is above all, it has no rival or competitor, for it is, in the very nature of the word, sovereign. This is God. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is, when I'm walking through the door of God's sovereign will, I got to realize first that there are things that God is going to do anyways. Believe it or not, God's going to do things that he's not going to consult you on first. God's is going to do things. He's not going to do a poll. He's not going to want to know if you like it or have an opinion about it. What, what does Isaiah say? That his ways are higher than mine. His thoughts are greater than mine. Why? Because he's a sovereign, above all, no rival God. And so we begin to, to realize this. I'll give you some examples. Um, when God decided that this is the time period in history that I am ready now to start creation, he just did it. When God decided that this is the moment where I'm going to send Jesus, my one and only son, into the world... He didn't call anybody. He didn't ask a prophet for their opinion. He just sent Jesus. When God determines that now it's time for my second coming, he's just going to do it. Why? Because it's his sovereign will. These are things that God is going to do anyways. Now, this is what's incredible. And this is going to blow some of you away. That God, in his sovereignty, chooses to use people to carry out his sovereign will. Okay, walk with me just a minute. I want to show you this. When God decided I'm going to start creation, what did he do? He created Adam and Eve. When God said, I want to now lead a nation, he went looking for Abraham. When God determined it's time now to get that nation out of Egyptian slavery, he went and found Moses. When God said, this is the period of history where I'm ready to send my son, he went and discovered a little teenage girl named Mary. When Jesus decided, okay, I'm getting ready to die on the cross, I'm going to resurrect from the grave, I'm going to send back up into heaven, and I'm going to start my bride, the local church, he found a handful of men and women in an upper room in Acts chapter 2 to carry that out. So wait a minute, you mean to tell me? 
that I can live a life that is positioned in the flow of God's sovereign will where God will actually use me to change the world? Yes. God is looking for men and women who will say, use me. I want to be in the flow of your sovereignty. This is why I talk all the time about the importance of you being a part of a local church. I honestly, yes, I love LifePoint. I want you to be here. But if this isn't your flavor, go get another flavor of ice cream somewhere else. Like just be a part of a local body. Like give and serve and invest and pray and share your faith and be the gospel and look at your neighborhood differently and your workspace differently and your, your kids' sports teams differently because this is God's primary will for your life is for you to be a part of what God is actively doing in the earth. All right? Okay. All right. So the second one that we see when I'm walking through the sovereignty and the moral will of God, or the sovereign will of God, the next door that I come up to is what's called the moral will of God. This is the ways of God. Um, th this is what's also described as the written word of God. And the moral will of God is absolutely the Bible. And I want you to see what um, Peter talks about, the knowledge of the Bible. He says this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter says, his divine power, God's divine power, has been granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So Peter's like, hey, listen, God has revealed everything that pertains to full life and how to live a godly life. And I bet if I was to say, man, how many of you want to get the most out of this life? Man, the hands would go up. And how many of you want to know that, man, you're living the way God wants you to live? Ooh, yeah, hands would go up. And then he goes on and he says, okay, here's how it is. Through the knowledge, that's referring to the Bible. You know the B-I-B-L-E wasn't created till hundreds of years after Peter wrote. Peter didn't know he was writing the Bible. He's just writing a letter. This is what God, through the Holy Spirit, inspired him to do. He says, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own, to his own glory and excellence. Now, this is the part where I think a lot of us get tripped up because maybe the version of the Bible that you've been introduced to is one of legalism. And unfortunately, there have been people in authority and pastoral positions and, and leaders and maybe even family members who have used God's word to regulate your behavior. And so the word of God is not freeing, it's limiting. It's not about release, it's about restraint. It's not about a relationship, it's about re religion and regulation. But I want you to, to, to re uh, reimagine what God's word really is for your life, that when you know the heart of your heavenly father and you love Jesus and you lean in on God, then you begin to realize that God's word is his voice captured in time, written for you, protected over centuries to show you how to live your fullest life. That God isn't reprimanding you, he's protecting you. It's the same reason why every good mom and dad, you would not let your kids play out in the middle of the highway. Like, nobody would look at a parent that's, le that's not letting their kid play in the highway and go, my God, you're so strict. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Live a little, okay? They're only four once, right? They're like, yeah, they're going to die if I let them do it. No, you, what do you do? You set up boundaries, not to limit them, but to protect them. And if you really believe that, then you start to understand that God has a moral plan for my life, and it's a plan to prosper me and grow me, and, and, and if you begin to lean into the moral will of God, I'm telling you, it will eliminate so many decisions that you're processing to make. You don't have to wonder, should I steal or should I not? Should I cut, you know, corners on my taxes or should I not? Should, should I, um, <laughs> you know, covet what my neighbor has and be greedy or, or should I not? Should I sleep with this person that I'm not married to or should I not? D do you see this? Why? Because it's already been listed in the moral will, the written word of God. And here's the thing about the moral will of God. You ready? It is the most clear and the most difficult. Oh, it's clear, but it's hard. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That's clear, but it's hard. Honor your father and mother. That's clear, but it's hard. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Clear. Uh, you, uh, it's more better to give than it is to receive, clear, but it can be difficult. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you, clear, but it's really hard. And I want you to see this though, man, when I'm living in the flow of God's life and I trust that his word is what's best for me, I'm now in the flow and I begin to, uh, I begin to allow the Lord to mold me, what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse two. And so now we get to this third aspect of the way that God reveals his will and this is what you came for. 
This is what you really want me to get to. I just had to lay the foundation. And that's what's called the personal will of God. All right, this is what I want to know. All right, should I, should I take the job? Should I not take the job? Do I move? Do I not? Do I marry him? Is there a better option? Do I invest in that? <laughs> do I invest in that stock or keep it over here? Do, you know, what, what, what do I, what do I do? And I want to show you something that I think is going to free you. You know what? You know what Paul says about this? By the way, God's personal will for your life is not really ever really talked about in scripture. Instead, Paul says this in Colossians chapter three, verse 17. Remember, he's writing to believers now. He says, and whatever, everyone shout whatever. whatever. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So you ready for this? It's gonna free you. It might mess you up too. When it comes to God's personal will for your life, it's whatever. I didn't want that. I want the formula. You mean I can choose whether or not I take the job or stay, add another child or good, marry this person or not? Yep. When, don't miss this, when I'm living in the sovereign flow of God, and so I'm actively a part of a local church. I, I'm, I understand that my main mission in life is for every man, woman, and child to get to, to, to meet Jesus because that's eternal. Everything else is temporary. When I'm living in the flow and I'm available to God and I'm living out his moral life, meaning, God, if there's anything in me that's not of you, I, I'm repenting. I'm getting rid of it. And guess what? God says, man, if you're living in that flow, it produces freedom. It's why obedience produces freedom. You know this, parents. The more your kids obey you, the more freedom you give them. Freedom produces uh, obedience, but obedience produces freedom. And so now when I'm in the flow of God's will, God allows me to choose because now I'm not looking for God's will in my personal life. I bring it with me. Y'all missed it. <laughs> if I'm living in the flow, there's freedom. And so when I walk through the door, I'm not looking for it because I'm bringing it with me. Because I am the gospel. I am. I got, I got freedom. But here's the, here's the truth, though. Let's just be honest. A lot of us are down there at that door trying to get through it, but we're not even living in the sovereign will of God. And so we're up here, you know, come on, God. You need to tell me what I need to do. And God's like, I just want you to be a part of what I'm actively doing. Because if I told you what I want you to do, you still won't find purpose in it. No, no, no. How about, how about, how about you live in my sovereign will for your life? And then I think most of us, if we're just, man, if we're just going to be honest today, a lot of us were sitting here at this door, the moral will of God. And there are areas of our lives that we are, we're not embracing God's love and grace for us. And so we're over here saying, God, what job should I take? And jobs, God's over there saying, I don't care about your job. I care more about your character. My number one goal isn't about your career. It's about, it's about who you are. It's not about your profession. I care about you, the person. I don't care what job you take. I care about the person you're going to be at the job. So maybe there's a moral will. And you don't hear God, not because God isn't talking, it's because we're not listening, but because there's something blocking the voice of God. And I believe it's in the flow of God's freedom that we begin to see and recognize just how free to choose we really are. So I guess what I want you to see today as we close is, you know, God's will is so much more about the present than it is about the future. It really is. God is way more concerned about your today than he is your tomorrow. It is about making choices today that are going to lead to a better tomorrow. God's way more in this moment than we think it is about the future. It's about embracing him. And I'm going to talk more the final week about the personal will of God to help get a little more clarity around this. But God's way more concerned about you than what you do. So I want to leave you with two questions today. And I just think that this is so fitting as we close our time together today. The first question is this. Um, what am I doing that I should not be doing? I just wonder, what are you doing that you should not be doing? Because that question probably is pertaining to God's moral will for my life. And so maybe for you, there are things that you're doing that you just know aren't right, but you aren't stopping the behavior pattern. And you're wondering why you don't, you, you're not embracing all that God has for you. Do you know what this word right here is that opens this door? We don't like it in the church. It's called repentance. But you know repentance is the mercy of God on your life as a believer. Repentance is God through his Holy Spirit saying, I'm not gonna let my hand go. And so there's conviction in your life that draws you to holiness. 
And sometimes God will convict you and he's saying, no, no, this is the love of God. That's why it says that the kindness of God leads to repentance. That's why one of the greatest prayers that you can pray is Psalm 139, the prayer that David prayed, when he said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, Lord. Know my anxious thoughts. And one of the greatest things you could do this week is just say, Lord, search me. Test me. God, what, what am I doing that I should not be doing so I can get in your flow? And then here's the second question I, I want you to consider today, and that is, what am I not doing right now that I should be doing? So what am I not doing that I should be doing? And I think this is probably a sovereign will of God question. Like, what am I not doing? I mean, am I a part of a local body? Am I a part of the mission of Jesus on this earth? Am I actively a part of what God is already doing, helping bring love, grace, and salvation to a lost, broken world? Am I available? Am I a Moses? Am I a Mary that just says, God, use me wherever I am? I would even ask you, have you ever given your life to the Lord? I mean, this is his sovereign plan for your life. This is why at LifePoint, man, we go crazy around um, a couple core values. We, we want people to know God. That's lost people saved. We want people to find freedom. That's free people set, uh, save people set free by the power of grace. We, we want you to discover purpose. This is free people trained. And then we want you to make a difference. This is trained people mobilized. Where, where are you at in that? Do, do you know God? Have you been walking with the Lord, but you're bound by religion and shame and guilt? Maybe you need to find freedom. Maybe for you, you need to be a part of our growth track when we offer it again and begin to discover purpose and the way God's wired you and what is my unique contribution to the body of Christ and then, then make a difference because that's where God is. And the question is, are we willing to make the steps to change? And so I just wanna end today by praying for you. And I believe today that the most important decision that any of us can make, and maybe you're here today, is to say, you know what? I've, I've actually never for myself given my life to the Lord. I mean, as I'm hearing you talking, I don't think there's ever been a moment where I've said for myself, you know what, Jesus, I wanna make you Lord and author and perfecter of my life. Have you ever done that? I mean, that is God's number one priority will for you is to fall in love with him, to receive his grace and mercy. I'm not asking if you believe in everything about the Bible. I'm not asking if there's things in your life that you need to change. See, I think that's where we get it out of, out of sync. That behavior always comes second. That transformation, salvation begins at the point of belief, not at the point of behavior. Paul says that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, that if you believe in your heart, watch this, that Jesus is Lord, that he resurrected from the grave, and you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you will be saved. That's why the Bible it talks about that today is the day of salvation. Why would you delay a decision like this when you believe that, that Jesus is God, he came to this earth, he died for me, and he resurrected on the third day. So I just wanna lead you through an opportunity just to pray that today all across the room. There's nothing magical about this prayer. It's a belief that happens in your own heart. But would you just close your eyes and bow your head with me today and maybe just quietly pray this to yourself. And I think that even if you are a believer, this is what a great renewal of a commitment to God. Just say this today, Jesus, today, I believe that you are the Son of God sent to this earth on a rescue mission for me. Not just them, but me. And Lord, on that cross, when your blood was shed and your body was broken, that was the sacrifice that was required to buy my life back. And you did it. And on that third day, you rose from the grave. And right now, Lord, I'm never gonna question it again. I place my trust and my faith in you. Jesus, I give you my life in exchange for this new life in you. Thank you, Father. I love you. Pray this in your name. Everybody who agreed said, amen. Amen. Come on.